Hello, so today I'm going to be blind reacting to a video by Christine. For those of you who don't know, Christine is Abby's mom. Abby is from Love on the Spectrum. There's a lot of controversy within the autism community surrounding Abby's mom and her views. I don't really care to demonize people right off the bat. I like to just let the person show me who they are and genuinely hear them out, gather all of that information on my end, and formulate my opinions that way. I want to start off by reading what she wrote in her caption because I think this is part of her disclaimer and I think it's important to give her a chance to basically preface herself before I dive into the video. Trying to answer this question with sensitivity to all and honor everybody affected. My personal thoughts and what I've observed over the past two decades is that the diagnostic term of spectrum has been diluted by incorporating other types of brains. I think it's important to understand the difference between neurodeficit and a neurodifferent brain. And I'm wishing the diagnostic terms were more specific like neurodivergent as a separate diagnosis and maybe those that are still struggling with expressive language had autism communication disorder. This is why we have such fighting and bullying from the autism community to the autism community. And this is why those with non-speaking adults have chosen to use the term profound autism because they're trying to acknowledge the symptoms and manifestation of that in their loved one. None of us are wrong. However, the DSM-5, the diagnostic manual, I see as the problem. The word spectrum is ineffective and insufficient, and the levels 1, 2, 3 are just too vague. I just think it would be so cool if we could diagnose different kids in elementary school and create interventions and support for them so that people get the help that they need when they need it. We should be focusing our energy for educational change as well as diagnostic change so we as a community of human beings are not fighting amongst ourselves. Okay, so I agree with a lot of the points that she said at the end. It's kind of like putting perspective into her viewpoints, right? What she is saying is that she believes that we all need support. I agree with that. We all need support no matter what level of autism we have. She's saying that she's not invalidating other people's autism and their spectrum. She's more so criticizing the diagnostic criteria, which, you know what? I can agree with, not to her extent necessarily, but I do think the DSM-5 autism diagnostic criteria is not that great for people like me even, you know, the level one low support needs autistics. It's so weird and ironic because she kind of thinks that people are getting diagnosed too regularly nowadays and that's why the DSM-5 needs to change. But I almost feel like the DSM-5 needs to change because it doesn't diagnose enough autistics because of how limiting it is. So in a sense, I agree that the DSM-5 does need to transform and evolve. I don't know if I agree that it needs to evolve in the way where level one autistics need a different diagnosis, but I do feel like something needs to change in a sense where people like me need a more streamlined way to get diagnosed and therefore the proper accommodations could probably come into play and be integrated into our systems. And some points that I thought was interesting and I don't quite understand, and hopefully she'll expand on this in her video, is her attachment to speech and language, specifically when she says autism communication disorder, that those individuals struggle with expressive language and that they've been using the term profound autism. So it seems like she uses two terms of autism that isn't necessarily an official term, but she uses it because she wants to distinguish the difference between people like her daughter who struggle with speech versus other autistics who, I guess she says, doesn't struggle with speech. But that's where the controversy is because other autistics do also struggle with speech, but not in the same ways as her daughter. For example, I struggle with speech very profoundly, not necessarily in the ways that Ab does, but it doesn't mean that I don't struggle with speech at all, right? Of course, I don't know a lot about Abby's mom, but I do observe and notice that she has this very strong attachment to speech issues, and she has a very specific idea of what having issues with speech is and how that 
feeds into her concept of autism. And if you don't have struggles with speech in that very specific way, then you're not really considered autistic. She says it here, there's a difference between neurodeficit and neurodifferent brains. So I think what she's trying to say is that neurodifferent brains don't really have deficits, they're just different. And that is not necessarily true. People's struggles are all different and it doesn't mean that one is less than the other, right? We cannot measure struggles like that in an objective way. You just cannot do that because that gets into a whole like philosophical debate. Just the specific word that she uses by saying that the diagnostic term of spectrum has been diluted by incorporating other types of brains. I disagree with that. I don't think that the spectrum expanding is damaging the community. Let me kind of expand on that because I think it's really important to make sure that we're all on the same page when we explore a topic. Sometimes people talk about the diluting of autism in terms of, let's say, a random person that is clearly not autistic and objectively does not have autism if they're struggling with having social anxiety, they automatically flagrantly use the term, oh, I must have the tism, or I must be on the spectrum, or am I acoustic? And they clearly don't take it seriously, and it's a joke to them. I feel like in that sense, I align with people who say that's not okay because autism is a disorder, and it profoundly affects people's lives and their health and all of that stuff. So I don't think autism should be used as an adjective, right? That's disrespectful, it's not okay. But if she is using it in terms of people like me who are level one autistic, who self-diagnose before getting their official diagnosis and stuff like that, that is a really valid journey. And it doesn't mean we struggle any less because a lot of the times the people who are getting diagnosed later in life are people of color. We have to talk about intersectionality when it comes to this conversation. Okay, that's a big question. Why do I think that there's more people being diagnosed than years ago in the autism world? And this is just my opinion after two decades kind of watching what's been happening. Abby is neurodeficit and a lot of people getting diagnosed today are neurodifferent. Neurodifferent means you didn't need speech and OT. Christine, Christine, let me ask you a question here. Can you fathom that there are people out there who needed OT and speech therapy, but could not have access to it? Is that fathomable to you? Can you fathom that there's a lot of autistic folks out there that needed speech therapy and OT, but they couldn't afford it? They didn't have the diagnosis because their parents don't believe in mental health. Their parents don't bring them to get assessed, get diagnosed. The parents don't think they need help, so they don't give it to them. Can you fathom that? What happens to those people? What if Abby did not have you as a parent? What if she comes from a family who either could literally not afford to get her diagnosed and assessed and accommodate her monetarily, or they didn't have access to it because no one else in the community is talking about it. They have no knowledge of it. Maybe there's even language barriers. They don't even understand English that well or the culture of America or what is even possible in the healthcare system or impossible in the healthcare system. And so they avoid the healthcare system entirely because they don't really know how to navigate it. What if their healthcare doesn't cover any of those things and they can't afford to pay for it out of pocket? What happens to those autistic individuals? Are they all of a sudden not autistic anymore because they have no access to the help that they need? Is autism only valid when you are getting that specific help? And all kinds of therapies and music therapy need- Music therapy. You know how many people, including me, would have benefited from OT music therapy and speech therapy, but we had no access to it. We had no support. And so we had to find ways to make it through life, barely, and find our own coping mechanisms that are harmful to get through. So let me challenge you in another way, Christine. Let's say I was diagnosed at a young age with my autism level one or whatever. Let's say I had OT and speech therapy and music therapy. Am I valid now? My autism is still the same spectrum. Is it valid all of a sudden? We shouldn't associate the validity to autism to someone's access to healthcare and accommodations and essentially money, class, and power. 
didn't need an aid to go to school and you didn't get pulled out of school to go to an autism school. You actually went to a typical school and you had no support and you were neuro different. That means you have a different brain processor. She was so close right there. She said you were in a neurotypical school with no support. Okay, but do you wanna expand on how that affects that autistic individual to be in a neurotypical school with no support? Just because they had to be there doesn't mean that they were supposed to, and it doesn't mean that they thrived there. Th that literally doesn't make any sense. Like I, I literally imagine pushing someone into a prison cell and closing the door, and just because they can't get out of it, you're like, oh, but you, you could be in there, so that means you could survive in there. And it's just like, no, I don't want to be in here. I want to get out, but I have no choice. If someone handed me the key early on in life, I would have unlocked myself a long time ago and walked out of that cell and moved on with my life and got my accommodations and my needs met. But I didn't have access to that key. And a lot of other people who relate to me don't have access to that proverbial key. So social communication, social language were painful and horrible, not your thing, and it probably made life horrible. So those people today are finally getting some acknowledgement, and I think that's a good thing, but I look at it as a different thing. It's more than just communication and social communication. I'm not going to speak on the behalf of all level ones, but for me specifically, I had learning disabilities that made school objectively impossible for me to function in. Did I get accommodations? No. I literally could not understand the things that we were learning and the way that they were teaching it to us. I could not process it for the life of me. It wasn't because I was lazy. It wasn't because I didn't try. There were so many times where I tried so hard and I would send myself into autistic meltdowns crying. We can all have differences in our neurology and the way our autism presents, but that doesn't mean there's a lack of deficit there. What it is, is there was a lack of support. There was a lack of access. That is the difference because you don't have a deficit, you have a difference. You are neurodifferent, and Abby, and people like Abby and Abby's programs were neurodeficit. Abby had 20 years of speech and OT and other services just to be able to talk like a neurodifferent person already can. Christine, are you there in moments where these level one autistics are nonverbal and are unable to communicate? and are unable to function? Are you there during meltdowns, shutdowns? Just because you've had to doesn't mean you could. Say it with me. Just because you've had to doesn't mean you could. Normal people that do not have deficits don't go through meltdowns from having to socialize. Autistic folks that have had to socialize or perform in holistic settings and in holistic ways don't do so because they could. They do so because they had no other choice. If they could, they wouldn't be suffering through meltdowns, shutdowns, alexithymia, chronic health issues, autoimmune conditions, comorbid mental illnesses like anxiety, depression, maybe even personality disorders that develop because of it, maybe even eating disorders that develop because of it, or body-focused repetitive behaviors like trichotillomania or dermatillomania. We really need to highlight what it means to be autistic and have your accommodations, and what it also means to be autistic that has no access to accommodations, and therefore how does that affect a person to be forced to do something that they're incapable of doing? It's not as easy as if you were truly autistic and had deficits, you would not be able to do blank. Not everyone has the luxury to be disabled. I know that's hard to believe, but there's a lot of people out there because of the color of their skin, because of their class, where they have to force themselves to perform despite being incapable and despite being disabled. 
and then suffer the consequences of having to do so. It's just so ignorant and insensitive to claim that just because they've had to survive something automatically means that they were able to survive it. And if they were incapable, they wouldn't have been able to go through it at all. If I took that logic and applied it to other groups of people, what would you say to a person that is in the military and has seen and done unspeakable things, comes back and is so debilitated by their PTSD that they can't hold down a job and function like a normal person anymore. Would you tell someone like that? Well, if you're able to see and do those things, then that means you're capable of it. Because if my daughter had to go do that in war, she wouldn't be able to do it at all. Or for example, a child who has gone through a lot of trauma and abuse at home and grows up to need years and years of therapy because they struggle with mental health, maybe even substance abuse issues. And you tell a person like that, well, if you're here today and you went through what you went through, then you're capable of going through that. Because if you were incapable, then you wouldn't have been able to go through that. Because if my daughter was in that situation, she wouldn't have been able to handle it. So she wouldn't have been in that situation to begin with. This logic will only make sense in a world where people had a choice in their circumstances and whether or not that's something they could work with, which in some instances with certain people, they have that luxury. Sorry, I'm, I'm just, I'm stressed, so I'm squeezing myself. <laughs> but we don't live in that world. We live in a world where there's a lot of people who've had to go through unspeakable events and are profoundly traumatized by it because they were incapable of going through it. And yet, despite all of that, despite their struggles and their deficits, they still had to find a way to survive through it because they couldn't choose to opt out. That's a whole other conversation. How many people, whether they were knowingly autistic or not, chose to opt out in this world because they were autistic and yet they didn't have the support that they needed for their deficits. So the answer is the DSM-5. I think the diagnostic manual the doctors are using needs to be updated and changed and real specific language needs to be created so that we can honor everybody and get them the help they need, but it's not the same thing. Putting everybody on the autism spectrum to me is not helpful and it's gonna make everyone autistic soon. I don't think it's going to make everyone autistic. I think it's just going to finally give people a chance to get diagnosed with the proper diagnosis and get the help that they need. There's not all of a sudden all these autistic people popping out of nowhere, out of thin air. We were all always here. We were just missed and we were not able to get accommodations for our deficits and our struggles. Why do you think there's so much intergenerational trauma? Because for a lot of people of color, we do have autistic relatives that went their whole lives without being diagnosed too, went their whole lives without accommodations and help. And they develop really intense coping mechanisms because of that. They had no chance to heal as a person or to have a healthy life. And so they pass it down to their next generation, to the next generation, to the next generation until me, I had access to information. I was able to fight for my diagnosis. And all of a sudden, it's a full circle moment where people in my family are finally realizing if you have autism and we have a lot of similar traits to you, then I think I have autism. And it's just like, yes, you probably do. And that's probably why you were so traumatized and living on survival mode. 24 7 and it's diluted the very meaning of the spectrum in the first place but that doesn't mean that the neuro different brain doesn't need its own category its own support it when you say things like we have to honor everybody and get them the help they need how are you going to say something like that when you're claiming the whole time that people like us don't need help because we're just different we're not living with a deficit her ideology it has a lot of holes in it and when something has a lot of holes in it, I feel like it's biased and it doesn't make sense. Like, at least have a sound logic, right? How are you going to say that we don't have a deficit, we're just different, but we also need to get help and 
we also struggled a lot in a neurotypical school. You know, that doesn't make sense to me. You're either neurotypical or you have autism and you're struggling with the deficits that come with autism. You can't be autistic, but only because you're a different person. You know what, that, that doesn't make sense. Like if I'm putting myself in your shoes, I would also feel upset, you know? Like if I think that all of these level one autistics that have no deficits are just getting diagnosed and claiming the title of autism, I would feel upset too if that's what I believed, but that's just not the case. And you have to, you have to call yourself out on those biases, Christine, you have to. There's a reason why that logic doesn't make sense and it upsets you because you're literally not opening yourself up to what it actually all means and realizing that it all actually does make sense. You're literally creating your own biases and enabling those biases by not actually listening and learning and integrating what the spectrum means. You're not letting it make sense. You're choosing that, girl. You're choosing that. If you're open, it will make sense. Trust me, it's really not that hard. It's own community because I think it does. There you go. I'd be curious to understand why she thinks it's not helpful to have more people be diagnosed with autism nowadays. Because I objectively want to listen to what her reasoning is. I am curious, does she believe that all of a sudden when more people are diagnosed, there's even less accommodations? Because I don't know if that logic makes sense to me. I, I almost feel like it's the opposite. When more people are getting diagnosed, society is going to have to make accommodations because they can't just fire someone when they learn that they're autistic if there's multiple people that are autistic. It's more like, oh, there's five people who are autistic in our company and they're struggling. Maybe we have to actually take accommodation seriously and integrate it. What is that logic that more isolation is going to help the isolated person? That doesn't make sense, Christine. That doesn't make sense. Okay, so I want to wrap up today's video by talking about what I feel like I want to see happen in our community and what my values and viewpoints are. I definitely do think that autism and the spectrum is very vast, right? There's people who are non-speaking autistic that I guess would be considered level three autistic or higher support needs autistic. I've worked with these kids and these individuals throughout my years and years of experience working with autistic folks. Trust me, Christine, I'm not ignorant. I understand that there is a difference, but where I want to kind of add more information and expand on that topic on is the concept that people like me struggle with the same issues with communication and speech as non-speaking autistics, but it's just at a different capacity. And I know that could be very triggering for some people to hear, especially parents of non-speaking autistics, but I think it's important to understand that people like me also experience becoming nonverbal. And it doesn't mean that it's just like this quirky thing that happens. It's profoundly a deficit that people like me face. And it profoundly affects our life and it profoundly affects our health. It's serious. There are so many times while I'm recording where I will sit here for 30 minutes just picking my hair because I literally become nonverbal in the middle of talking and I can't function. If that happened on a job with other people around me, I would be fired. I wouldn't be able to perform that job. I would have no job. You know what I'm saying? So yes, it is a deficit. Yes, it does affect my ability to support myself. I'm just lucky enough to have a job like this where if I am nonverbal, I could afford to turn the camera off and go stim outside for however long I need before I could come back and talk again. Or if I can't talk for the rest of the day, I could just be nonverbal for the rest of the day and then try to re-record the video the next day. There's been times where I come to film a video and I'm just sitting there and I literally can't talk, I can't think, I'm straight up nonverbal and I just get so upset with myself that I have an autistic meltdown. I can't do that at a job outside. 
I need to, but I can't. It doesn't mean that I'm not struggling. I find ways around having autistic meltdowns at jobs or being nonverbal by, let's say, not working full time because I literally am incapable. I am disabled. Even though I need to work full time in order to support myself, I literally can't because of my autism. I only work part time and even working part time is debilitating towards me. What I would love to see in the oncoming years is just understanding what autism means as a whole including the circumstances that they're born into and how it affects different people, whether that's their race, whether that's their economic background, whether they're immigrants, actually integrating intersectionality to the spectrum and how all of that interplays with each other. Because if we really want to measure struggles and deficits here the way that Christine does, then I'm sure if we measured, let's say, a level one autistic Black woman, for example, who has to face oppression in almost every system possible, has no support, has to fight off all of these harmful stereotypes. Her struggles, if we put it on a scale, may surpass Abby's if we really wanna measure struggle like that. So does that all of a sudden mean she has level three autism compared to Abby? Because we shouldn't measure autism by the struggle. We should just understand what autism means, what coping mechanisms do we have to develop in order to survive with our circumstances and with our specific type of spectrum. And therefore, I feel like finding ways to integrate autistic folks into society comes with understanding what autism means. It comes with realizing that yes, there are a lot more autistic folks than we thought. People like me are finally able to claw our way into an assessor's office and get that diagnosis. But it doesn't mean people like me weren't existing before. It doesn't mean that all of the autistic people in my family weren't existing before. It's just they were invisible and they had no access. They had no chance. If we really start to see how big this community is, we cannot be ignored anymore, right? I feel like the way that society views and treats disabled people at this point and throughout history is like, oh, there's just a little part of our population that's disabled, so we can afford to just ignore them and discard them and not find ways to accommodate them. But as more and more people get diagnosed with something like autism that's considered a disability, you kind of have to start to integrate accommodations. I wonder how many of our homeless population are actually disabled individuals or people who have autism and they didn't have access to get diagnosed or to get the care that they needed. This topic is way too complex for you to split it into a binary neurodifferent versus neurodeficit. We all are working with neurodeficits, but because of what we look like and where we come from, our ability to accommodate those neurodeficits are gonna be at different capacities. And that's not necessarily because of anything other than outside sources and systematic issues or intergenerational trauma and intergenerational issues. I hope that Abby's mom gets the help and support that she also needs to perhaps get to a place of piece where she has the capacity to learn more information about where our understanding of autism is growing. I don't think that's going to stop anytime soon. And I feel like if she continues to hold true to her values now, she will be miserable. And that fight is going to feel like a losing battle for her. And I don't want that. I don't think she deserves it. I want her to feel at peace. I want her to feel like she's fighting for a purpose that's moving forward and is helping everyone in the way that she wants it to. I believe that she could get to that place. You know that term where before an illness dies in your body, it has its last fight? I almost feel like that. Like she's being very vocal about her views of how level one autistics aren't necessarily autistic and they need to be diagnosed with something different. I feel like her being that vocal is kind of like a tower moment in a sense where that ideology is kind of working its way out of her system. And I hope that when all of it starts to crumble for her, she can rebuild a stronger foundation to build off of and actually move forward with what her intention is and that's for us all to support each other 
and to continue fighting for our accommodations and our needs to be better integrated into society. We all just need to listen to each other more. There's a reason why people like me are speaking up about our autistic experiences because one, it was never ever talked about until this point. So we need to get that information out there. And two, we are all ultimately fighting for the same things. People like me who are speaking up, we are not just fighting for ourselves, we are also fighting for Abby's, you know? But yes, I feel like this conversation is very enlightening and it's much needed. If there's anything that you guys would want to add to the points that I made or that Abby's mom made, share that in the comment section down below. I think it's pretty safe to say that either way, this conversation is much needed and it's made possible because of people like Christine speaking up. So. In the grand scheme of things, I, th I think it's good that she's speaking up because it does open up a very important conversation for us all to explore together. And I do think that as we all hash it out and process it together, we will arrive at a better place. But right now it's just kind of like getting a lot of these points across and a lot of the times it has emotional weight to it because of course it profoundly affects all of our lives. So I think it could get ugly sometimes or emotional or triggering for some people. Um, I'm not gonna lie, I felt pretty activated myself while watching Christine's videos and processing her viewpoints, but I think ultimately it's good for us all to explore these parts of ourselves through each other and to have a safe space to talk about it. But yes, thank you guys for joining the discussion. Be sure to check in with yourself. I will see you guys on next week's video. Bye guys.